we're gonna go live. Welcome to Wine Shark Wednesday. It is I, your host, the Wine Shark. I think we're live. Yeah, we should be live now. Okay, everything's great. Hello, is everybody? Hope we're all doing well on this fine afternoon. We're going to be trying something funky and different today. Pardon me, I'm making sure my phone is muted. Funky and different today. We're going to be talking about the Beatbox Rising, uh, Crazy Tax Systems, uh, and a bunch of uh, Alphabet Soup, uh, RTDs, and FMBs, and IRCs, and oh my, all kinds of fun things. Uh, I saw this topic a little while ago, and I've been seeing this product in the store, and it's in the wine section, not in the beer and others section, and it kind of caught my attention. And then this article came across my my, uh, my feed, and I started reading it and kind of digging into it and thought it would be something interesting for us to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about the, the categories of new drink stuff that's kind of coming around. Uh, including uh, flavored malt beverages, ready-to-drink cocktails, um, the, uh, the things that are based in sugar that apply to the internal revenue code, and then wine-based beverages like Beatbox. So um, you guys have heard me talk a little bit about uh, FMBs uh, in the past, and I'm sure every single one of you has seen them either at the store or somewhere, or probably enjoyed one of your own. Um, this is the very broad category of new things uh, coming onto the market, everything from uh, seltzers to, uh, to all kinds, uh, you know, and seltzers and ciders and 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 anything else uh, in this, this very broad and interesting category. Um, the the rise of this has been a very interesting part of the liquor industry segment. Uh, it's the fastest growing uh, segment is this new kind of non traditional thing that is things that are not beer, and not wine, and not spirits that are in neither of these three big categories, and they have been eating into the market share of those, uh, especially in the beer and wine category, in a demonstrable way. So I'm just gonna talk about a little bit about some of these definitions so that when you hear them uh, out in the wild, you're kind of familiar with what they are and what they might not be. And then I'm gonna talk specifically about wine-based uh, beverages and why they're kind of unique, different, uh, and, and we're gonna then, of course, try out some beatbox as well. So. Thank you guys for joining me, and a wave to, to John and Mark and Betty and uh, Donna. Good to see you guys. So we're going to talk today, first thing, the first thing we're going to talk about FMBs, flavored malt beverages. So this is the longest standing category of this particular group, but they're basically based on a on, on beer. Right? They're, they originally come from beer and beer manufacturers. Um, they're taxed as beer, and you're going to hear me talk about taxes several different times throughout this conversation. Um, and so they're usually, you know, kind of historically made by breweries, and they were designed basically to capitalize on the on the uh, materials they already had for people that weren't beer drinkers. In other words, if they if they if Miller Coors wasn't capturing you with their Miller Coors brands, and they still wanted to get you know get your dollars worth, what could they sell you that was approachable to a non beer drinker? So uh, by law, any product that is six percent or an alcohol by volume or lower. They must have. They have to be made from at least fifty-one percent malt, and they must include hops, even if it's just a tiny, tiny amount. They must do those two things. Kind of puts them into that beer, beerish category, but again, not necessarily. When it comes into that FMB category, they're taking that 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 alcohol in a neutral format and then adding flavoring to it. If it's above six percent, it has to be made with ninety-seven percent malt. Now, FMBs can taste like anything. Uh, because they're flavor neutral to begin with, you can add in whatever flavors you want to it. So they do everything that tasting like from, from gin and tonic to tequila to fruit punch to anything else and in between. Um, the uh, Cayman Jack Cuban mojitos that I really enjoy are an FMB, as far as I know. Um, so they're kind of tax that, but the key thing is that they're taxed like beer. And beer, wine, and spirits uh, it successively are more and more taxed because of the overall alcohol by volume perception. This is that holdover from uh, prohibition where, you know, you don't know what's good for you. And while beer is okay for the masses, we have to, we have to uh, tax people more for those that are drinking higher alcoholic beverages like wine, and then even more if you're into the devil's spirits. So uh, the other name that you might be hearing a lot of is RTDs. These are ready to drink. Uh, usually ready to RTD cocktails. Ready to drink cocktails is the 
is almost always a caboose to that particular uh, acronym. Um, so that usually means in the industry that we're talking about canned cocktails, which, um, you know, but you made with spirits as a base. Okay, so these are things that this is where your gin and tonic is actually gin and tonic, not a gin flavored malt beverage. Okay. Um, although the category is very, is not necessarily hard and fast rule like that. There's no law that says that. Um, that's more, it's more of a, a tradition within the, within the industry. But so they could, because they can indeed include seltzers, uh, wine coolers, even other, you know, different, different, uh, types of beverages can fall under the RTD umbrella. And in fact, technically, um, we talk about beatbox, beatbox is an RTD because it's ready to drink out of the bottle and or out of the, out of the, out of the packaging. And it has a, it's already flavored. You're not mixing it together with anything. Um, but when, when RTDs are made with spirits, they're taxed as spirits. So they're taxed as more, taxed higher than beer and FMBs. Okay. Now there, there's this suburb sideline thing called the IRC code, the Internal Revenue Code. Um, this uh, section of this particular law of Internal Revenue Code 27 CFR Part 7, for those of you that are going to go look it up, um, it refers to sugar based beverages and the according to the article that i was reading this by the way a lot of big shout out here to birvana and vine pair a lot of where i got my information from a lot of this stuff I'm doing my research um the the author of, of birvana basically said yeah the rules are super convoluted and you can go read them if you want to but these are mainly seltzers but not the ones that qualify as fmbs remember fmbs have to have that malt in them if they've got sugar as the base of what they're fermenting they actually fall into this different category. Um, so, the, again, it's this weird quasi category. And here's another confusing and fun funky part. If a IRC co taxed uh, coated beverage, which is made with sugar, and it has spirits in it, it can still be regulated as a beer because of its low ABV. Again, kind of contravening the whole thing. It's one of those, well, why the hell did you bother? Why not just tax it based on its ABV by itself? Well, because again, different industries, different lobbyists, different laws. Um, it's it's a it's a weird quilt and pack and, and uh, you know and, and patchwork of funky stuff. Okay, but the one that I want to talk about, and on, on interestingly, the smallest segment are the wine-based beverages. Um, there, this is um, there there for a long time we didn't have a handy acronym for this. Um, but wine coolers would be kind of that that category, and they're taxed as wine, but not beer. But uh, in another article that I was reading, there is a new handy acronym. They're calling it they're calling it OTS, other than standard wine. So this is the stuff that's made from grape spirits, right? So so we're talking about you take grapes, you ferment them, you take that alcohol away, take the flavoring of the wine part away, as everybody cries a little bit into their glass. And you have just neutral grape spirits. This is what the OTS category is. Um, so the federal, to give you an idea, the federal excise tax for spirits, okay, for the highest taxation level, is thirteen dollars and fifty cents per proof per gallon. So something that's a hundred proof, right, is going to pay. Thirteen hundred and fifty dollars a gallon in taxes. Oof, oof. That's just or actually no, thirteen fifty, right? Yeah. So per proof gallon. So that whole or and it says per proof gallon. So it's not thirteen hundred fifty dollars, thirteen dollars fifty cents in that gallon. But that proof gallon is the whole t whole ticket. Now that number drops to about a buck oh seven for regular wine, up to sixteen percent, and about a buck fifty seven. Per gallon for uh, things that are between 16% or above. So it's dramatically cheaper in taxes to make a wine-based beverage. So if you can get away with getting the kick you want out of your wine-based spirit, you're going to be paying a hell of a lot less taxes. Okay, so on the order of like you know 10%. So um, OTS wines are you know so these other than standard wines can be jacked up to 21% ABV while staying in its category. So very similar to what we're talking about, basically, that's effectively the same level as fortified wines like ports or sherries. Okay. Um, just to give you kind of a weird segment of idea of the market segment here, um, of the 
um, of the percentage of the of the items that we're talking about up above. Um, if we if you bundle everything in this category as a ready to drink cocktail, flavored malt beverages run about ninety one percent of the market share. About eight percent of them are based with spirits, but just one percent are based with wine. So this is a very narrow segment right now, and this is why it's interesting and growing. So Beatbox, uh, this our wonderful little product today, was actually created by some uh, some business majors. Uh, down in Austin, Texas, and then they went and got it on Shark Tank. He got some funding, a couple million dollars in funding from uh, Mark Cuban and from a couple of another uh, other couple of places, and really kind of took off on this product. Um, this is 11.1% alcohol by volume. Okay, so we're talking about 21 proof, basically 22 proof, um, and. This is, has grown like a weed. Um, they, they definitely have very, very business savvy. They've got a lot of different segments that they can put their finger on with a single brand. Everything from the example that we have today, which is the Fruit Punch, which is 11% ABV. They have a lower ABV version if you want to be a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more uh, conscious of that of that consumption level. Um, they basically it's their quote unquote keto friendly version. Um, they're very, their packaging is very eco-friendly. This is called a, um, uh, what's it called? The, the uh, um, uh, Tetra Pack is what this is called. So it's, you know, very, it's very, very good on the environment. It's non-glass. It's recyclable. It's designed to be taken to events and parties and, you know, places where glass would be prohibitive. Um, it's light. It's cheap. You know, it's, it's recyclable, 100% recyclable. It's all those kind of cool things all in one. All in one. Uh, now, I mean, to give you a sense of just how much this particular business has like grown in the last three years, uh, their their case count in 2020 was 380,000, which then grew to 850,000 in 2021. And this year, they're currently on track to sell more than 8.1 million cases of this stuff. Uh, the the popular uh, kind of zeitgeist around this stuff is easy too. Uh, because that ABV is so much higher. So a lot of your FMBs, a lot of your non-beer alternatives that are in this sweeter category are all in that 5 to 6% alcohol by volume. Ciders and flavored beverages generally fall to that 6% line or so, maybe a little bit higher. But this is almost double that. So, you know, they're talking about party math here being efficient. The idea that one little box of this, and also this box, four bucks. Right, so talk about inexpensive as well. They're very much targeting a market of youthful, conscious, price friendly. All these things are all wrapped up into one thing, um, and it's really kind of interesting. So, it, they said the uh, the thing that caught my attention. I figured we'd talk a little bit about it and give one a go. Um, we'll do the uh, the wine quiz here while I get to sample some of the some uh, some here while we start, and we'll get going. The uh, the interesting thing. Let's talk about this. This fruit punch, it's um, and I'll do this before I do the grocery store grab portion of it. It starts off with a with an alcohol base from wine at about twenty one percent alcohol. They ferment orange peels in the fermentation tank to increase the ABV uh, and strengthen it past its regular grape, uh, you know, its regular grape numbers, which is usually you know sixteen percent. Okay, um, they add water, they add whatever flavor, they add water to kind of give it bulk and to bring that ABV back down. Right, and so we're going to go from twenty-one percent to you know, in this case only eleven percent. So that's that dilution factor. Um, they add whatever flavoring they're going to have, and they've got you know I think of the stand I saw they probably had six different flavors, and I think on the website as I was looking for the images for this I saw at least another five or six. Um, but then they add a little bit of cane sugar and a little bit of Splenda, according to the owner, uh, to give it its final flavor and flavor profile. So. It is definitely a, a, a Capri Sun for adults is what we're, what we're talking about drinking here. And, uh, well, again, a weird wine-based beverage, but wine nonetheless. So definitely worthy of our uh, discussion. So, all right, let's do a wine quiz, and then we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about, uh, we'll talk about the beatbox itself. We'll look at the packaging and some of the other stuff as well. But we'll do our wine quiz first. So our wine quiz, based on our game Wine Wars, has, is basically like a trivia game. We're going to base the five different categories, vine to vino, which is about growing grapes, making wine, and the world production of wine. We've got grapesphere, which is about the grape varieties, the, the types of wines that they're made from, and their geography. Then we have the wine cellar, which is about selecting, storing, and tasting wine. 
wine and food, which is about cooking with wine, serving wine with food, and pairings, and wine service. And then cork culture, which is about wine people, want the business of wine, arts, sciences, and trivia. So we're going to play a little stump the chump here and see how yours truly does in our ongoing wine quiz. All right. First question is true or false from the grapesphere. Chaptalized wine or, or wine made with the addition of sugar is always inferior to wines made with natural sugar levels. Ooh, there's an always word in there. So chaptalized wine is always inferior to not chaptalized wine is really what it is. So chaptalization is the addition of sugar. By the way, why would you add sugar? You need to think all the way through. The reason chaptalization happens, generally speaking, is for ripeness challenged grapes especially in northern climes, like, say, Germany. Okay? So my answer here is no, it is not always inferior. It says false. It says properly done. Chapelization can produce fine wines. Yeah, chapelization is used as a tool to increase alcohol by volume when you don't have grapes that are really fully ripe. Um, it's a winemaking technique like any other. It's a farming technique. And... While, of course, you know, the modern health market would look at you, you know, you see these stupid ads on Facebook like, oh, my God, they add sugar to their wine. I'm like, first off, it's not cane sugar like you think it is. And second, it's rarely used outside of places like that. You generally don't see it in most of the wine world. So don't listen to your Facebook friends. All right. So that's correct. The answer was false. All right. Which makes the Semillon grape ready for a beneficial attack of noble rot? Is it tight grape clusters? pink tinged color or it's thin skin so what is it that makes semillon a, a, a good target for the noble rot or the uh, botrytis cinerea three answers cluster tight clusters pink you know, pink pinkish color or thin skin <laughs> all right give everybody a chance to answer here Oh, yeah, daddy's juice. Ooh. All right. The answer, I'm going to say, is tight grape clusters. Uh, clustering of grapes oftentimes um, allows the moisture to stay, which causes conditions to be good for no rot. But I think John Mayles would be right. It could also be thin skin. Well, the answer was thin skin. So the botrytis cinerea, the no rot, gets on there. It has to puncture through the skin to drink the water out of the grapes. That must be its other reason. But I bet you a buck it also has a tight cluster grape. Um, although pink tinge color is incorrect, is not is a nut, is a uh, uh, is a red salmon or <laughs> pink tinge salmon because uh, and it's supposed to a red herring because well they uh, are it's a white grape it's a yellowish green color. So all right, what tasting term and quality characteristic describes wines that seem multidimensional in aroma and flavor? So what tasting term and quality characteristic describes wines that are multidimensional in aroma? What's the term that we're going to use? Question, question, question. Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and say something simple here. We're going to say body. The quality characteristic, the tasting term is body. Hmm. This one they say depth or complexity. Wine's depth or its complexity. Okay, I'll accept that one as the wrong one. Yeah, see, so and so is made full body. Yes, this one's comp. I love the idea that it's multidimensional equals complex. All right, from the wine and food category, which is a common substitute for Shaoxing rice wine in Chinese recipes? So if you're going to replace Shaoxing in Chinese recipes, what is its substitute in the Western world? Is it Madeira, Sherry, or Port? Shaoxing rice wine, which is it most like? Is it Madeira, Sherry, or I've never had Shaoxing rice wine. I've had rice wine from Japan. I think. Okay. Not had Shaoxing. So, um, I'm going to be guessing right along with you guys here. Um, if we're cooking, it's usually going to be the first two, not port. We rarely cook with port. So it's either going to be Madeira or Sherry. I'm going to go ahead and say Madeira. Oh, no, answer was sherry. Yeah, sherry you often cook with as well. Rice wine could easily be similar in flavor profile, so you can easily see that one. Huh? Not doing so hot today. Off on my trivia for sure. 
Last but not least, true or false, in celebration of the 2008 space mission, U.S. Navy Commander Kenneth Hamm took American sparkling wine on board the space shuttle Discovery. True or false? Was there champagne allowed on the space shuttle? I'm going to go ahead and say false, because that just sounds space dangerous. I'm going to do some crazy sabrage and knock a window out into space. The answer was false. Lacking a sparkling wine bottle to withstand zero gravity, Ham took the Schramsberg corks and labels. So He brought labels instead. Look, we'd be having this if we were back on Earth. Hooray, celebration. Well, at least I got that one right. So, all right, not a bad little wine quiz today. Very cool, very fun. Always like, you know, stretching the brain and learning new things about wine. So, let's get into our grocery store grab. So, the premise of the, the usual grocery store grab. Well, my problem is with zero G, John, it's really just about gas. It's not about how gravity works on it, though. Mostly, I just think the fact that, remember, a bottle of sparkling wine is under about 90 PSI about the same about double what you have the pressure on your car tires right it's pretty darn explosive and if something were bad to happen to that you know i think it's more about the pressurization less about the gravity so vacuum not not zero g would be would be the enemy but anyway the uh, grocery store grab we here at one shark you know and we understand that we want to get the best value per dollar at non-grocery and non-big box retailers. If out of convenience or necessity, you happen to shop at the grocery store for your wine, you're probably going to find yourself in a place where you may not we have uh, no good advice coming from staff. So you can't go to a good quality staff and say, hey, I like this. What else would I like? So we rely on label-focused wine purchasing when we talk about the grocery store. And so we go in for common brands that are easy to find and kind of talk about what their wine labeling looks like making sure that they tell us what the grapes are made, what the wine is made from, what grapes are made from. Uh, if it's a blend, what percentage of those grapes are what. Uh, we want to know about simple, common flavor words that tell us what's in the bottle. And we want to know who's making it as transparently as possible. But as I said, it's a special topic today. Our wine for today. In fact, actually, I'll do the official photo here. Uh, da, 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 where is images? How'd that end up over there? There we go. The label. Hooray. There we go, our 11% boy one of, this is the Beatbox Fruit Punch in a handy dandy bright and fruit punch themed uh, uh, label there. So this is a 500 mil box for four bucks. As it says, three five ounce servings, or 5.63 fluid ounce servings. So roughly three glasses of wine, right? This is three quarters of a, three quarters of a bottle. So, uh, and again, for $4, it was very inexpensive. I was actually kind of surprised because usually when you talk about an equivalent product, although you get a lot more volume in a Sega six pack of beer, um, the prices are significantly larger. So, all right. So, Mark says he saw a special zero gravity bottle at a wine museum for champagne. So, you see, now that's all about timing, Mark. I'm telling you, man, those, those space shuttle folks need to get it together so they can uh, they can get their get their wine in space. So, okay. So, let's talk a little bit about this labeling, though. This is an interesting topic. I mean, obviously, it's kind of a it's kind of bright. We talked already about the Tetra Pack, how this is the same sort of thing you're going to see with wine of a similar size. Now, the crappy part, as I was, as I was saying from a price perspective, because, I, I mean, I don't know how the taxation level on this works or whether they're just doing cheap. Normally, when you see regular, quote unquote, fine wines that are in boxes of this style, you're paying a hell of a lot more than $4. Uh, so it's really an interesting equivalency question when it comes to how they are serving this at that cheap level. Um, on, the label, on the back label here, it says best served chilled. It also says that you should try it but You should try it frozen. So if you really want to have your nice sparkling treat, uh, or sorry, your nice fruity treat um, at poolside, you could also throw this in the freezer. Um, there's Oh, hey, there's a little QR code on here. It says it's gluten-free and glass-free, which, well, I mean, we kind of assumed it was gluten-free due to the fact that it is made from wine, not beer. Uh, but it, that's a great alternative for folks who are indeed gluten intolerant for one reason or another. Let's see what this thing. We're going to go to their link tree here. Their beatbox. So they've got a store locator. You can become a fan member, sign up. You can win a thousand bucks on Cash App because that's not a scam. Uh, beatbox X Festival giveaways. 
Talk My Store Bar. They've got a whole, they're all linked in here. Their Discord, VIP tickets to events, festival rules, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, everywhere, and zero sugar serving facts. Interesting. So they're very well uh, lined up in that digital world by using QR. Um, I would, it's interesting that it's not about this beverage in particular, it's more about the brand, which I find interesting. Um, other than saying fruit punch on the label here and the fact that we might want to try it frozen, it's the world's tastiest party punch, right, according to them. And it says it contains alcohol, so that you don't slip this into Junior's lunchbox. Although maybe not, maybe you do need to slip this into Junior's lunchbox. The rest of it is the government warning label and all the official tax stuff. So, unfortunately, Beatbox is very much relying on their branding to do the work here. Um, although I guess to say, you know, it's not giving us an ingredients label. So for those that are concerned about that, might not be too sold on this. Uh, for instance, it, uh, it doesn't have a um, any sort of FDA style of information. For instance, calories per serving or anything like that. I'm surprised, actually, considering how they are aiming at that particular audience. Um, but, so, other than the color that is, it is flavored of fruit punch, which, you know, is flavored of fruit and sometimes punch. Um, not, not a lot of nuance here. I mean, I don't think that we're asking for subtle hints of, hmm, subtle hints of strawberry, possibly razzle-dazzleberry. And definitely a schnozberry. But uh, it is bright red in color. It looks exactly like what you think a fruit punch should look like. And, to be honest with you, it tastes the same way as well. It tastes barely alcoholic. This, at 11% alcohol, could be really damn dangerous for you at a party or a poolside. Because you could be sucking these back and not even notice the fact that there's alcohol in them. For, until you're like, oh, hey, I'm hammered. I've got three... I've had three of these things, and I basically have had four bottles of wine. How cool is that? So, uh, anyway, uh, tasty, easy, high ABV, great for uh, you know for opportunities for moving, uh, for being out and mobile. Obviously, they're they're very much predicated. In fact, the owner who would talk was talk about um, when the guys that got together that created the product uh, were all music festival fans, and we're like, you know, if we could capture the vibe of being at a music festival for people every day the world would be a better place. And that's kind of, a, he says, you know, that's in our DNA as a company. And I think that's a really interesting kind of perspective is that they're very much, they are a lifestyle brand. In the same way that the Prisoner Wine Company is a lifestyle brand, so is Beatbox. It's a different lifestyle, uh, but it's just the same type, but it's the exact same approach where you don't need to know a lot what kind of fruit is in fruit punch. That's not what you're here for. You know, you're here to have a good time and get your, get your ABV on and go from there. Mum Grand Cordon Stellar Champagne. Okay, excellent. We'll check out the uh, the wine museum link there. We'll uh, search for that, as Mark pointed out. So, did they have a? Well, they've got. Uh, they're showing their their champagne service. They've got it on the. There's a YouTube video here of it on the Vomit Comet, which, by the way, that's the the colloquial term for the training jet that takes people into their first examples with microgravity. The plane that does a parabolic arc like this, and you can float for a few minutes. So, kind of neat. And especially because it does this over and over again, hence the nickname, the Vomit Comet. So, Pernod Ricard. Here's, a, here's the Mum website. Okay, I'm going to enter my birth date as 1901 because I always think that's fun for these websites to screw, to screw with their numbers. That's right. I'm a veteran of the First World War. Oh, no, not 1091. That would be a really interesting one. By the way, 1091 was not a valid year, according to that app. Just FYI. <laughs> it cannot be born at the time of Charlemagne. Anyway, uh, let's see. So, as, as uh, Mark was saying, my son, mum, reinventing champagne for space and zero gravity. In 2018, they, used it to, they, they, they brought a bottle that was to, uses the champagne's pressure to expel the wine into a ring-shaped frame where it's concentrated into a cluster of bubbles. It can then be passed to someone and released into the air where it floats until gathered up by a specially designed glass. And there's a fun little video here. I wonder if I can stream it. I still haven't figured out how to get the stream from my mind to my, mind to my screen on my software. I'll have to figure that out so we can watch videos together. But yeah, that's kind of cool. Thanks for sharing, Mark. Very fun, very fun indeed. So yeah, uh, Beatbox Fruit Punch, guys. You should totally check it out. Again, if it's four bucks, you know, there's no downside to that. 
Um, I guess for my tasting notes, is it well executed? Yeah, sure. It tastes just like punch. Is it on style? Yes, it's on style for punch. Is it worth the price tag? At $4, it's exactly the price you expect to pay for punch. But um, I really dig this. This is kind of, like I said, for, for something that's very non-wine-like, uh, this is an interesting product. Definitely doesn't, no, doesn't suck, doesn't taste awful. I was afraid that after reading the ingredient list and doing my research uh, for the previous segment of the show, I was afraid that it's going to have that kind of saccharine taste or that it would taste, you know, that even with its punch nature that it would have some sort of overriding uh, alcoholic lingering taste. And the answer is no, no, it does not. So bravo on us for enjoying that. You guys could go check them out. Uh, upcoming events with the Wine Shark in the Wild. Um, things, strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Um, we've got two more shows on Sundays at the Sleeping Panther in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, still trying to get uh, get bodies and volume up there. So if you have an opportunity, please come support us. Really trying to have a good time up there. But we're also going to shift up the format going forward. Uh, we're going to switch to Thursday nights. And we're going to be doing a wine and jazz party. Rather than uh, doing a topical uh, interview or sorry lecture style uh, class with me, it's going to be a come and go affair for a couple of hours uh, each Thursday night from like, we're going to do it from like 7 to 9, 7 to 10, something like that. Kind of like a happy hour. You come in, you can pre-purchase tickets that'll basically get you a free wine flight, or you can just come in, order glasses of wine at the bar, you can use a full service bar, and you can also buy those same tickets to get yourself a discount on a flight of wines. We're going to have jazz guitarist, uh, what is my jazz guitarist name? Oh, I've already, sorry, I've already forgotten, um, Boone, his name is Boone. And uh, he's going to be out there planning to start us off. So that's going to be the 29th of September should be our first show. Um, I'm really excited about switching uh, over the format to be like that. Uh, Reunion Tower. Um, here, waiting to hear back from them in October and through December. We're trying to do Saturday nights at the Tower at the Geodeck. Similar in concept. It's going to be a later night show after 9 p.m. And I'm thinking about doing it as a station-based, casual music in the background, hang out, enjoy the Geodeck. I will be there for chatting and whatnot, but it won't be a sit-down class-style environment. It'll be something fun, casual, and social. So those two events are going to be a lot of fun coming up in the fall. And we are still working to the final details of Agtoberfest. That's at Horace Hall in the Stockyards at Fort Worth on Friday the 23rd and Saturday the 24th of September. Uh, yours truly and Two Penny Beer will be hosting a station-based wine tasting and beer tasting. So you can come and you know, for your ticket price, you get five wines, five beers. We selected by us to fit that Oktoberfest theme. Um, the Aggies are going to be celebrating their valley, their their uh, their uh, game. They're going to be uh, the rivalry with Arkansas, and they're going to be in town to visit to go have a great football game with them. So if you want to come support and see the football game, want to hang out in the stockyards, have a great time, come check me out. Um, more details as tickets become available. I will get you all my details. So thank you guys very much for coming to visit with me. Um, if you have any comments, ask them in that comment section below. Get your additional questions, your suggestions on upcoming topics. I always like hearing from you guys uh, about things that you guys want to see and want to do. Um, if you like what we're doing, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, share with a wine-loving friend. Um, you can also follow us over on Patreon. Some new things coming Patreon ways. Like I said, I promise September we're going to be shifting up. Uh, so look for that in the next couple of days. I'm going to be making an announcement over there about shifting up how we do Patreon and what we what Patreon is for, and basically that way you guys are getting the, the kind of value you want out of it, um, especially turning it effectively into more um, individually based rewards. So uh, if giving away things on the on the on the Patreon like hey you can win your own custom uh, either online Zoom meeting or in person wine tasting or what types of value for propositions do you guys like? Because, well, I've tried a lot of content creation. We aren't seeing a lot of uh, interaction there. And I want us to make sure that we're all going in the same direction so that you guys get value and we have a great time together because I love your support and I appreciate all of my Patreons so much. So thank you guys once again. Uh, go get yourself a glass of punch. Enjoy yourself for the rest of the afternoon. And uh, until the next time, I have been your wine shark. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Definitely straight out of the schoolyard. Oh boy. Cheers, y'all.